Next, I'd like to introduce Linda Argoti. Uh, she is the David M. Kerr and Barbara A. Kerr Professor of Organizational Behavior and Theory at the Tepper School of Business at Carnegie Mellon. She's also the director of the Center for Organizational Learning, Innovation, and Knowledge. Um, she is a leading expert on group and organizational learning, innovation, knowledge transfer, and organizational memory, um, the latter being uh, directly relevant to her talk today on transactive memory systems and collective intelligence. So thank you, Linda. Thank you, Anita. And I'd like to add my thanks to everyone else for the uh, organizers uh, putting together such a very interesting interdisciplinary conference. I think we've all been learning a lot. Uh, I would like to talk about transactive memory and its potential relationship to collective intelligence. Uh, due to the great job Betsy did, I'm going to sort of blitz through the beginning of my talk, which uh, uh, sort of develops a concept and then get, get to more of the evidence and the new stuff. Um, so Betsy talked about transactive memory was a collective system for encoding, storing, and retrieving information. Uh, colloquially, it's often known as knowledge of who knows what. Uh, here's a picture from Fortune magazine that for me sort of captures that where imagine you're the person in the middle, but then you have all these other people that you can contact for information. And, and Betsy has uh, alerted us to the fact that the internet is one of those uh, powerful sources as well. Um, this was an example that I thought might be an example of transactive memory. Don't have evidence that it's transactive memory per se. But I thought of it uh, last weekend when I was reading how Klinsman uh, released Donovan. Uh, maybe people in here know soccer better than I do, but uh, evidently Donovan had taken a sabbatical, um, so his motivation was questioned, so he was released from the national team, so he's not going to play in the World Cup, so that just happened. Uh, but it reminded me of something that it uh, was written about in 98 when the US hopes of the World Cup uh, ended with a loss to Iran. Uh, the coach released the captain because his ego was out of control. And here's a quote from the captain. Uh, he, meaning the coach, didn't realize how really together we were as a team, how well we knew each other. I watch the team play now and that understanding is not there. Uh, Thompson, he's a Sports Illustrated author who was commenting on this, says uh, they couldn't predict each other's movements because they didn't know each other well enough. So this, I think, might be an illustration of transactive memory. Uh, we have folks in the audience that have been looking at sports teams much more carefully. Uh, Colleen Stewart, who has a, a paper here on uh, hockey teams, uh, and I understand Jose Uribe. Jose, where are you? Uh, Jose, hi. Um, has a piece, um, is yours on soccer? Or f yeah. So they've got the more serious evidence. This is just the, the food for thought that this might be an example. OK, we heard about this from uh, the top part from Betsy. Uh, the part I'm going to talk about is how some of my colleagues, Dick Moreland, Diane Liang, and I thought uh, that while this concept was originally developed for people in close relationships where they specialized in the way that Betsy described, uh, we thought that also seen that going on in organizations. Uh, so we have done a couple of studies, as well as Andrea Hollingshead, Kyle Lewis, uh, and, and many others, applying it to organizations. Uh, originally, most of the work was in the laboratory, uh, but more recently, the amount of work in the field has increased. So we're seeing, uh, I think, a nice balance of both lab and field studies. Let me put up a learning curve. This is what got me interested in the concept of transactive memory. Uh, I was doing a project with Dennis Eppel on learning curves in manufacturing. Uh, this is a learning curve from an advanced jet. Cumulative output, the uh, amount of experience is plotted on the horizontal axes. Label hours per aircraft on the vertical. And you can see the characteristic decrease at a decreasing rate as experience is gained in production. We had been interested in that phenomena because there's a lot of variance in the rate at which organizations learn. Uh, these data come from three truck plants. They're all part of the same organization. They're producing the same product. Uh, there are some differences in technology, but it's the uh, best performing, the one with the lowest unit cost, and the worst performing with the highest unit cost that use the same technology, and the one in the middle that uses a different technology. So that doesn't seem to explain the differences. So this phenomena really intrigued us, trying to understand, well, what's 
explaining this difference because many of the factors that you think might explain it, like different products or different organizations, uh, were constant here. So we, uh, before we started our empirical work, we interviewed people. These were uh, managers, engineers at assembly plant about what they thought was driving the learning curve and what might be explaining some of these differences. Uh, the first three things had already been discussed in the literature. Well, individuals are getting better at their jobs. Second, uh, they're improving the tooling. They're fine tuning the layout. They're improving the technology. Third, they're improving the structure and the methods of coordination. Uh, but the fourth thing they said was a better understanding of who in the organization is good at what. Uh, they didn't use the word transactive memory, uh, but this seemed to me very much similar to the transactive memory concept, which uh, Wegner had been talking about at about the same time. Uh, and thinking about it in terms of the way Wagner had talked about it gave us a way to look at that, at least in the control setting of the laboratory. So I'm going to talk about uh, two of the early studies Dick Moreland and I did with Diane Liang was on the first, Rajani Krishnan on the second, uh, and then give you an overview of where the state of the literature is now uh, and what the current and, I, I think, promising future directions are. So this first study, we were informed by the work on the uh, assembly plants. We wanted an assembly-like production task. So we decided to have people assemble transactive radiator, uh, not radiators, radios from kits. Uh, the training session was delivered in different ways. The first study was very simple. We either had them do it individually or do it as a group. Uh, and then the testing session, they come back one week later uh, they perform as groups, and we collect measures of their performance uh, and transactive memory. Uh, the performance measures, we have measures of recall. So when they come back at week two, the first thing we ask them to do is write down everything they remember about uh, making the transactor radio. Uh, then we uh, also measure how quickly they assemble the radio and how many errors they make. We measure transactive memory by looking at the videotapes, having coders, you know, two coders, blind to condition, et cetera, uh, code for what we saw as indicators of transactive memory. Was there a sort of specialization where people seem to remember different parts of the task? Uh, were they able to coordinate and put together what they were doing? Uh, and did they trust each other? So if someone said, oh, uh, Nikki said, oh, I remember how to do that. Did we sort of let him do that? Or did we grab it out of his hand and said, yeah, the last time you told us that it didn't get very far. Um, so we looked at whether there was sort of trust of expertise as indicators of transactive memory. We found in the lab that these were fairly highly correlated. So we've used them, summed them together into one measure, although in the field with naturalistic groups, they may not uh, be correlated, which raises a, a different set of, of issues of how to handle that. We can talk about later. Um, for a lab study, it's a fairly complicated sort of task. Uh, so here's the transactive memory index. Uh, you can see the groups score higher on it than individuals. Procedural recall is in the foreground. Groups recall more than individuals. And assembly errors is in the background. Uh, and here, the groups make significantly less than individuals. So what we were hypothesizing, that it was only in the group condition that they would learn who was good at what and would develop a transactive memory. And we did the mediation analyses a la Barron and Kenny uh, and found that the transactive memory did, in fact, uh, mediate the effect of training on performance, that the performance benefits of the training together were uh, due to the operation of transactive memory systems. And we tried to rule out some alternative explanations, uh, such as cohesiveness and identity through uh, questionnaires that we asked them about. And then uh, used those as mediators, and they were not, uh, did not meet the criteria for mediation. But we thought, well, let's try to do something more powerful than rely on these questionnaires. So in the second study, which was joint with Dick Moreland and Ranjani Krishnan, uh, we added two additional training conditions. So the first training condition we added to people who were individually trained, they were giving a team building exercise. Uh, the idea behind this exercise was to have them be comfortable with each other, to uh, become familiar with each other. So uh, this would enable us to 
rule out the interpretation? Well, is it just they were more comfortable with each other and, and that's why they did better when they trained as a group? The team building exercise wasn't related to the radio, so they didn't learn anything about who was good at aspects relevant to assigning the radio. Uh, the second condition we added were participants trained in one group and performed in another. Uh, and this was added to investigate, well, maybe people just learned how to be effective in groups. And that's what uh, is driving the benefits we observed in the first study of stronger performance. Uh, so these two conditions we added to the original two you saw, train as individual, perform as a group, train as a group, perform as a group. So we had four conditions in this study. We were predicting and we found that only cases where you trained and performed with the same members where you had the opportunities to learn who was good at what uh, were associated with higher transactive memory and greater performance. Uh, and the other three conditions did not differ significantly from one another. Uh, so uh, we've, we've seen this in a, a both in the lab and the field. Transactive memory improves performance. Uh, Ching Ren, uh, Kathleen Carley, and I did a simulation a few years ago. And one of the things that came out of that was that transactive memory seemed to be especially valuable in changing or dynamic task environments. And I think the intuition behind that is that it's in environments that are changing where you're more likely to need to go to someone for advice. If your task is stable, you've probably figured out how to do it, and you don't need to ask others for advice. But when the task is dynamic and changing, that's when you're most likely to need advice from others. Uh, we've also done a study on a product development task. So I was interested to hear Betsy's work on the transactive memory can facilitate creativity. Uh, because we found this at the, the team level, uh, and what the transactive memory seemed to do was enable members to envision new combinations of things, which uh, led to creative new products. So looking across the many studies of transactive memory that have been done since Wegner's initial introduction of the concept, some of the major predictors we're finding across multiple studies uh, experience working together is a predictor, whether it's achieved naturalistically or more explicitly through group training. Uh, there's also been some work, Moreland and Mayakovsky and Stasser have done studies showing that providing information about member expertise or creating a synthetic transactive memory, if you will, um, also has been shown to improve performance. I think it would be interesting to take this idea and look at it in terms of some of the newer technologies, in terms of either uh, yellow pages providing, well, maybe not so new, but uh, providing information about who's good at what in organizations and whether those, in fact, uh, do improve the performance of the organization. Uh, communication. So I was intrigued to hear uh, David when he talked about in the uh, session preceding this talked about predictors of collective intelligence. This was uh, one of the major predictors of collective intelligence. Uh, for transactive memory, it seems to be valuable, uh, especially when it's early. Uh, and studies that have contrasted face-to-face -face versus virtual or email find that face-to-face -face is better. Maybe not surprising, it's richer. But studies that have just been conducted in a virtual sort of environment still find that um, that kind of communication is valuable in creating transactive memory. Uh, some studies have found a negative effect of stress. All the others have been positive effects. Uh, and a shared social identity. If group members feel that they share an identity, they seem more willing to invest in the sort of collaborative division of labor um, that is the hallmark of a transactive memory system. Uh, if we look across outcomes, the original Wegner study showed uh, improvements in satisfaction. There have been other studies showing that in the field at the team level. Uh, reduced errors or defects, multiple studies have shown that. Reduced time and cost, the Farage and Sproul is a study of uh, software engineering teams that found transactive memories improved performance as measured by time reductions and cost reductions. And then recently, there's been some work suggesting that it can also increase innovation and creativity. So I was very interested to hear about Betsy uh, is also working in that, that area. Uh, in terms of promising current uh, future research themes, 
Uh, I think one is how social networks affect transactive memory systems. Uh, Colleen Stewart has a very, Colleen's over there, has a very uh, interesting, is that what your paper, your poster here is on, or? <laughs> Sorry, okay. <laughs> Uh, of how social networks affect transactive memory systems. Um, effective new technologies on transactive memory systems, and, and we've heard some Betsy about the idea that the internet can be sort of a, a knowledge source, a, a node in your transactive memory. I think the other way we're seeing it is looking at how new technologies like blogs or chat rooms, how those enable the development of transactive memories on perhaps a broader scale. Um, a related point is extending transactive memory from the group to the organizational level. So most of the studies I've talked about were at the group level. There have been a few uh, more qualitative studies at the organizational level, but I think that's the area that's really ripe for further development. Um, many interesting questions. Uh, personnel rotation, we know that that uh, is a mechanism for transferring knowledge. Uh, it can also undermine transactive memory, but is there a sweet spot where you have enough stability that your transactive memory still conveys benefits, but through personnel rotation, you're able to move ideas so that they uh, spread throughout the organization? Um, structurally, would building TMS, a very strong TMS at the group level, and then having the links in this sort of small world, um, a la uh, the small world theory, uh, would that be a way of enabling a strong transactive memory at the organizational level? I think it would be unrealistic to think we'd you know, know who's everybody, who's good at what in these organizations that consist of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of people. Um, but can we build groups that know each other well, who do highly interdependent work with then maybe some links to other groups so they know what to um, access when they need it? Uh, to do this also requires uh, developing new measures of transactive memory. The measures so far we've used have either been uh, videotapes where we observe groups uh, and code for indicators of, or surveys where we ask uh, members of organizations to fill in about indicators. That's really hard if you're trying to uh, measure that at the organizational level. The, the videotape, you know, can we scale that up? That, that might be challenging, although might be worth thinking about. Um, so I know some of us are thinking about, well, can we measure unobtrusively transactive memory through the, the various chat that goes on or the traces people leave, uh, and can that be a way of measuring transactive memory in these larger organizations? Uh, and then coming back to the theme of this conference, uh, I think it would be very interesting to explore the relationship between transactive memory uh, and collective intelligence. And, and I could imagine uh, scenarios that a well-developed collective memory uh, enables transactive memory, uh, or is collective intelligence an antecedent of transactive memory? If you have a well-developed collective intelligence that would enable you to recognize expertise. And I think Anita has some uh, work suggesting that that happens. Um, or the predictors of transactive memory this, uh, similar, and we've seen one similar one has, has emerged in terms of communication. So understanding these two concepts more fully and uh, how they overlap or uh, what's the relationship between them. Does one predict the other? Or it's probably a, a recursive sort of relationship. Uh, and then relatedly, uh, how do they relate are they substitutes or, or complements? Are uh, transactive memory and collective intelligence complements in the sense that they can be uh, used in conjunction with each other so they positively reinforce each other and improve performance? Uh, or they're substitutes, they're sort of you choose one or the other and they're, they're sort of two paths to high performance. So um, these are some of the questions I've been thinking about and, and find very interesting to uh, contemplate more in terms of the work we're hearing today, and um, I hope, uh, I know I've learned a lot to help me uh, sharpen as I think about that more. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.